Welcome to the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow's Innovation District. My name is Alison Culpin. I'm absolutely delighted that you've joined us today. Uh, this is our inaugural Global Showcase and it's to allow members insights into groundbreaking work taking place here in Scotland. There will be an opportunity for you to ask questions and that they will be answered at the end of each presentation. So I hope that's helpful. Also, we're going to put uh, links to the presentations um, in an email to you tomorrow and also the direct details of each presenter. I'm not going to uh, carry on anymore because you're not here to hear me, you're here to hear our presenters. So I'm now going to hand over to Dr. Alison Jackson of Salsa. Thank you, Alison. Would you like to start? Thank you very much. Um, so as Alison said, my name's also Alison. Um, I'm the Executive Director of the Scottish University's Life Sciences Alliance. And what I want to do is just really set the scene about how exciting and collaborative and innovative Scottish research in the life sciences is here. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background, about 10 years ago the Scottish Funding Council set up a number of research pooling partnerships to drive Scottish research forward in a really collaborative and strategic manner. And so there are a number of these research pooling partnerships that exist. Um, for example, there is a physics one, a chemistry one, an energy one, and we're the life sciences one. So you can see on this map here, these are all our partner universities. We have 11 of them across Scotland. Um, and this includes two Russell Group universities, the University of Glasgow and the University of Edinburgh. And what we're trying to achieve is we're trying to get Scottish researchers to think more broadly about working with uh, researchers all the way across Scotland, um, outside of their university, but also partnering with industry um, and other key players in the Scottish innovation um, landscape. So what we're trying to do is make Scotland really competitive in life sciences. And we're doing this in a number of different ways. Um, so we are trying to get strategic collaboration happening, especially now we have a lot of uh, place-based agenda coming through from the, from the UK and Scottish Government. Uh, we're trying to get people to work across disciplines. So obviously life sciences covers a very broad range of, of science, but also working with engineers, physicists, computing scientists. And we really want to try and recruit the best international talent into Scotland to help uh, ensure that life sciences in Scotland is, it remains excellent. And we think we've done a pretty good job so far. So actually, um, Scottish Biosciences Research, we actually successfully get 20% of the UK research funding that is available. Um, we only have a population of 8.3%. And if you look at uh, how our research is assessed for research excellence, um, Scotland's life sciences is continually approving and we are far above the UK average. So the strategic aims of SOLSA um, are here. What we want to do is build collaborative partnerships in a strategic manner. We're very interested in supporting early career researchers in their transition from postdoctoral scientists to independent researchers. Facilities is a key, um, a key thing that we support because you can't do excellent research without cutting edge facilities and you'll hear today about some of the different ones um, that we've supported around Scotland. We're also working to develop collaborative arrangements with industry um, and now considering the political climate we're in, we're also starting to develop international partnerships. We also do work around life sciences policy issues, um, working with various bodies and also the government and funders. So very briefly, I won't dwell on this, but we have four research themes in, in SOLSA that covers the real breadth of the life sciences research in Scotland. So we have a development, development and regulation theme, which is a, effectively a fundamental cell biology theme. Um, we have a more clinical, translational, um, disease theme. We also have an ecosystems theme that's really driven by the push from the government around industrial biotech, synthetic biology and, and sustainable agriculture. And then we have a technology and analysis theme, which is a theme that sort of underpins and undercuts all of the other research themes um, because you have to be at the forefront of all the exciting technology developments to do excellent research. So I just very briefly wanted to highlight some of the strengths of our full member universities. Um, 
Obviously, this is a non-exhaustive list. Some of these universities are absolutely massive and so they will cover loads of different things. Um, but just to give you a flavour of the breadth of expertise we have here in Scotland, um, at Edinburgh University, dementia um, is a key research focus and there's actually a UK Dementia Research Institute branch in Edinburgh. Uh, synthetic biology, again, Edinburgh is one of the hubs for the UK's synthetic biology. Uh, and they also have excellent expertise in cell biology and regenerative medicine, stem cells. The University of Glasgow is leading Scotland's precision medicine ecosystem with their development and partnership at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital in Glasgow and the clinical innovation zone there where you see um, different in, um, companies relocating there to do research and work with the researchers but also the clinicians um, all together. We also have strengths in Glasgow in parasitology, um, cancer through the Beetson Institute. Um, there is, and we also have um, a um, British Heart Foundation Institute in Glasgow and the only um, virology research institute in the UK, the Centre for Virus Research is also at the University of Glasgow. Dundee is really famous for its screening and there are a number of really amazing facilities in Dundee. Um, there's the National Phenotypic Screening Centre, the Drug Discovery Unit, and they have also a huge proteomics facility there as well. Tied to this is an anti-infectives welcome centre research unit, and they also have very strong research in phosphorylation and ubiquitination that's supported by the Medical Research Council. Aberdeen's well known for its mycology research, um, as well as its cardiovascular research, and the Rowett Institute has a very strong history of nutrition research. Um, St Andrews over on the coast has very good links to marine and conservation research, um, and really St Andrews, their sort of motto is interdisciplinary research, and they do this by co-locating lots of researchers from different fields together. And Strathclyde, where we are here today, they have an extremely strong um, natural products research groups and also pharmacy and translational pharmacology is very strong here as well. So I just want to quickly finish with some key highlights from SALSA over the last 10 years. We have supported the establishment of the synthetic biology field um, in Scotland and across the UK, mainly through investment in staff and research infrastructure at the University of Edinburgh. We've also driven metabolomics research in Scotland, again through supporting facilities. And as I mentioned before, we have supported a number of other facilities um, in Scotland. And, and we also put technologists into those facilities so that you have those people with that really specific expertise being able to drive that kind of um, technical research. So we've recently invested in the CryoEM facility at Glasgow and an NMR facility in Edinburgh. We've recruited some really top amazing talent from overseas and we partnered with MSD to bring a really extensive um, studentship program, um, the Scottish Life Sciences Fund, over the past probably five years and we've funded over 90 people through this venture. We've invested over three million in research and development programs. Um, as I mentioned, we were involved in, in helping UK DRI in Edinburgh set up. And we've leveraged over 425 million for the Scottish life sciences sector in, in Scotland. And finally, this is my last slide, I just wanted to give you one example of how the research pools have worked together even beyond their own disciplines to bring um, about projects and changes in, in sort of a multidisciplinary project. Um, so we have a grant with two of our sister pools Super, which is the physics pool, and Synapse, which is the medical imaging pool, around optical imaging. And the idea behind this project is to bring together researchers um, from physics, life sciences, and medical sciences together to try and answer questions um, that will meet the needs of clinicians and those in industry um, around optical imaging. So from things like optical imaging med tech right down the line to more fundamental advances in microscopy. Um, and so we have some really amazing work going on in uh, the University of Harriet Watt, in Edinburgh, in Glasgow and in Dundee. Um, and this is also feeding into the white paper for, for photonics that is going to be released um, next month, I think. And so with that, I will um, pass you on. 
Thank you very much for listening and I'd just like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Paul Andrews, who is the Chief, Ex Chief Operating Officer of the National Phenotypic Screening Centre, which is one of the university's Dundee's flagship screening centres. Thank you. Um, as I was saying, uh, we, we established this site, and I'm, I'm not going to labour the point now because we need, probably need to move uh, the thing forward, but um, what we're trying to do is, is look at very much patient-centric uh, cell biology, uh, disease biology, tissue biology, and we're trying to embrace all of the biological uh, advances that have happened in the last five or more, more years, such as stem cells, CRISPR technology to genome engineer, uh, 3D cultures and co-culture models. So we have assays which are very complex assays, for instance, mimicking the, the bronchus, of the, the human bronchus, or mimicking the immune system where you have multiple cell types in the same assay. And we're, we're hoping that we can find drugs which will be more effective because they've already got a great start in their life. So instead of starting very late and then looking retrospectively, we're starting earlier and looking at the, physio the human physiology. Uh, we, we, we generally focus on human biology, but we do obviously have interest in animal and plant health, and I won't talk about that just now. Um, so we, we have strong farmer industry links, and I'm going to talk in, in two slides' time about the one we have with Janssen J&J in phenomics discovery. Uh, and then we've also trying to, as Ali uh, suggested and intimated, we're, we're very interested in finding out what the next disruptive technology is, whether it's to do with optical imaging or it's to do with single cell sequencing or whatever. So we're trying to be a crucible, if you like, where we can bring together the life sciences um, to see application. Because, because we speak to the pharma industry quite often, we've spoke to almost everyone, I would say, over a period of time, um, we understand a little bit more than the average academic about what the industry needs. And so we can sort of work out uh, work as a bridge, if you like, or an interpreter. And so because quite a lot of the people in the lab and in Dundee in general have worked in pharma, there's, there's that barrier of language which is, which is missing in other parts of, of academia. So, um, so we also partner with, with small and medium-sized enterprises and chemistry partners, for instance, and that can be in academia or in industry. And I'll talk a little bit more about that because there's some exciting developments in AI and drug design. Uh, which are coming through, and then we're also in the beginnings uh, of setting a spin-out company out, uh, up and also doing CRO business. Um, so the next slide is an example of not pharma collaboration, but something which has a global impact, and this is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and this is trying to address one of the sustainability goals, which is to uh, reduce the global health impact of maternal and child mortality and begin to uh, trying to uh, eliminate unnecessary poverty which occurs because um, women get trapped into circumstances they find uh, that there is unavoidable, or in their ways, in their lifestyle is unavoidable. And so the Gates Foundation uh, tasked us, um, or tasking a number of people, to try and find new contraceptives for male and female, um, but we're specifically focused on looking for a new male contraceptive. And in fact, not, I say new, actually there aren't any male contraceptive drugs out there. There's some some hormonal-based ones, but it's very clear that the hormonal ones are very difficult to uh, get men to take, unfortunately. And we, I'm not going to get into the argument around this now, but we, I'm sure everyone in the audience here in the room, uh, who are mainly women, could uh, have a good old ding-dong on that one. So, <laughs> but anyway, this is, this, is the, this, is, this is a project which has started uh, a couple of years ago now, and it's now in phase two. We've just got a um, million dollars from the Gates Foundation to to accelerate this now into the MedChem stage. So we've, we're, we're really doing a, quite a nice job at the moment, I think, hopefully. And this is just a, a, a graphical abstract uh, to show that we can, we're using effectively donated human sperm. So this is obviously very patient-centric. We pool donors of, um, pool a number of donors, and we do the drug discovery to try and find the molecules which inhibit uh, sperm uh, motility and the formation uh, on, on the head of a sperm which allows it to enter the egg. And so we, we're running this, this dual assay platform on our phenotypic um, robots and our, and our microscopes. And we're, we're now, we think we've just about screened 16,000 known drugs which are out there, and we've got some very interesting start points. Um, but we're also about to screen 100,000 new start points uh, to try and get new medicinal chemistry uh, insight into the way that the chemistry interacts with the particular biology of the sperm. Because actually the human sperm is very different to a mouse sperm or a rat sperm, so you can't do these experiments in in animals, and also um, the human sperm is very different to a normal cell in the human body because it doesn't transcribe and translate very much, so you have to target different things for different reasons. And so we're targeting motility and the ability of this, uh, the, the head of the sperm to enter the egg. 
And so this is, again, something which is also initially uh, is supported because it's supported our centre, and, it and it's cross-disciplinary. So we've got chemists, we've got sperm biologists, we've got the discovery scientists, all together, working towards a common goal funded by a charity. And there's obviously, you can see, immediate commercial impacts of this down the line. If we do find a male contraceptive, then it is adopted. But the flip side is also we can, we can find drugs which increase fertility. So we're going to have some commercial opportunities around that increasing fertility because that's a big area of, of, uh, of, of, of interest. So in terms of working with uh, pharma, we, we set up in 2015 a framework which will allow pharma to interact with us and we to interact with pharma. And, and it's set up, it's called the, Discoveries, uh, sorry, the Phenomic Discovery Initiative, PDI for short. And we've been working since 2015 with Janssen, which is part of the Johnson Johnson Group, as you know. Um, and this is really to try and de-risk this pre-competitive phase, especially in this new area of phenotypic screening, which is so important. Uh, and most pharma companies now are in this space, and they want to have access to the academic community, the clinical community. But often they, they spend a lot of time going around all the academic centers and having individual collaborations. So what this allows you, a uh, pharma company to do is go to a one-stop shop, if you like, a safe harbor, where the pharma companies can access automatically the partner university academics, not automatically just because they've been whipped into doing it, but because of the, the framework, the, the terms and conditions are all there and they, the universities have signed up to them. So when new universities give assays to us to develop along the, the sort of lines of, of what pharma wants, then we can bring those into the fold as well. And so they, they become associate academic partners and they also sign up, sign up to the terms and conditions. And the, in terms of the collaboration, this is really about the pharma companies paying us to develop the assays, to source the assays, to do, do due diligence around um, those assays, taking time away f so they don't take time away from their own um, staff within, within the pharma partners. And we, we source the assays by accessing a global network. We started obviously locally within Scotland uh, and then we ended up, we now have assays which come from Chile, uh, Canada, uh, several from Canada, Harvard, uh, California. Basically we cover the globe now. We, we have the last round, we've had three rounds and we have 50 applications usually that come in um, and that's not using a global marketing uh, strategy or anything like this, it's just through our networks. And I would say about, we can fund 10% because we have a limited amount of money that we have. Um, but if we had more money coming in, I would say we had about 50% of those assays could be fundable. So we have to be quite rigorous and quite ruthless. And we have a scientific committee uh, that is comprised of industry partners and academic partners who are experts in all the different areas. And then we can co-op people which have specific disease uh, therapeutic area expertise. And so we go for a top-down, bottom-up approach. So we target key opinion leaders, but we also have a very crowdsourced approach. Uh, to, because you can't always tell what's out there and what's in, in people's labs, so we, we, we advertise that and then they submit assays through either a specific disease focus area, um, addressing a particular need, whether it's inflammatory bowel disease, cell stress, infectious diseases, cardiology, etc., uh, or dementia, or just a blue skies approach which says basically submit anything to us and we'll just review it. We've at, we, we develop the assay, we validate it on target-specific biologically annotated molecules. In the case of Janssen, they were kind enough to assemble 1,100 molecules which are against specific targets uh, within the cell. And then we also have, we kickstart medicinal chemistry program using an 80,000 diversity set, which in the case of Janssen collaboration um, is called their jump starter set, which allows them to jump into their larger collection. And that's been a really good collaboration with Janssen uh, that hopefully will continue uh, longer. Um, and then, uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but we've got quite a wide portfolio. Uh, you, you won't be able to read all the details on that slide, but we've got everything from the inflammasome, we've got immune oncology, uh, reactivating um, exhausted T cells, for instance. We've got cancer, we've got we've different types of cancer, mesothelioma, um, we've got glioblastoma, uh, we've got dementia, uh, we've got bipolar disorder. We've got a huge uh, range of things uh, which we're looking at. Um, we're also conscious of the fact that we can do things better. And so we've started uh, to work uh, with actually the guy who was the person who thought about this idea in the first place, Andrew Hopkins, who's a medicinal chemist ex-Pfizer. And he came a number of years ago to Dundee and established the lab there. Uh, and then he now has labs in various places. But, um, and he also has set up a company called Exientia. Um, 
and this is a university spin-out, uh, and it's really trying to accelerate and improve the way that drugs are designed. Not necessarily discovered, but definitely designed uh, to accelerate the phase of drug, uh, drug development, which goes from the, you know, the hit to lead and the lead optimization to the preclinical candidate stage using artificial intelligence approaches, sort of Bayesian modeling and a number of other approaches. Um, and so he has uh, Series B funding just recently announced um, with Celgene and GT Healthcare, um, and then is obviously growing the company uh, you know, very rapidly at the moment. Um, and he has deals just announced with Roche, uh, deals with GSK and Sanofi and so on. Uh, but working with, with that company who are w in close partnership with the, hopefully to try and tap into government money to really try and apply the AI aspect that they do for the chemical design in, into a wider um, uh, project which is to do with phenomics driven drug discovery. And, and if anyone's interested, I can, I can address questions on that topic uh, later, but I'll crack on to move on to the other things in Dundee which are really exciting. So the drug discovery unit was established um, back in 2005 and six, again with significant support from Scottish government, uh, Salsa, uh, really by these two guys, Mike Ferguson and Alan Fairlam, uh, who had the vision that there was not enough uh, drug discovery done on tropical, neglected tropical diseases. And that's their, that's their passion, that's their interest, uh, that's their academic interest. So they set this thing up and did an amazing job of building this over a number of years now, uh, getting huge amounts of money in uh, from a variety of sources, not just charities but also commercial uh, avenues as well. And now it has two threads. It has the tropical diseases area, which mm -hmm. is expanding into lots of different areas, um, and hopefully long may that continue. And that's now funded by the Wellcome Trust, and it's called the Wellcome Centre for anti infectives Research. And this is a big deal because the Wellcome Trust doesn't uh, award many of these centres, so it's a very, good, um, a very good thing for Dundee. But it's also got an innovative targets portfolio where it tries to identify uh, proteins which have got a uh, good level of target validation with a particular disease and try and um, accelerate drug discovery in that way as well. Uh, partially using phenotypes and partially using um, more traditional ways of biochemical uh, drug discovery. Um, and so they have uh, links with Bill and, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, DNDI, MNV, um, and a number of different pharma companies. Uh, and it's a, it's a very exciting place to be, Dundee, for this reason. Um, this hasn't come out very well on this screen. Hopefully you can all see it okay, but this is a little example of how this type of academic drug discovery is essentially doing the full stack of drug discovery to the point where it becomes a preclinical candidate and then someone takes it on. And this is an example where, you know, there's lots of companies working on it now, but at the time, hardly anyone was working on anti-malarials. And so they started a program a number of years ago where they wanted to try and find new avenues into treating malaria for obvious reasons. Um, and so they actually started with a phenotypic screen using a very small number of, of molecules which are focusing on kinases, so the, the scaffolds that resemble kinase inhibitors, and they used a blood stage parasite to do a phenotypic screen. And they got results from that, which then allowed them to, through a series of years, of course, and lots, lots of authors, uh, to, um, to identify a compound which was very effective um, in fact, so effective that a single dose treatment cures mice um, and it, it blocks transmission and it offers chemo protection. So this is kind of the gold standard because in terms, terms of a target product profile, that would be your gold, um, you, you know, your, your, your gold standard, if you like. In fact, probably above and beyond the gold standard. And so this was then, all of this data was published in Nature article uh, a, few, a couple of years ago now. Uh, and then... Actually, Merck got very interested, and they then have taken this on to first in-man trials. They got all of the data repeated, of course, as quite rightly should do. Uh, and then, and you know, this is now a, a really nice, interesting project, as well as a few other things um, going on in Dundee. There's this one as well, which is looking at visceral, uh, visceral leishmaniasis. Again, this has come from a slightly different route. So this was, they also, the Dundee Drug Discovery Unit and the Wellcome Trust Centre also works on Chagas disease. Trypanosoma brucei, uh, and they were doing a screen looking at a particular target which they thought was interesting called GSK3 kinase, and they found a series of compounds which had off-target effects, and they looked into this and then decided they would test them on leishmania, a slightly related organism, um, and then, in fact, found uh, molecules which were actually quite good at leishmania, uh, but they weren't very good at trypanosomes. And so they then kicked off a series of... Um, uh, drug uh, discovery, well, drug development programs, which really culminated uh, with a 
pretty good candidate, which then was identified, uh, the target for it was identified um, by working with GSK and cell zone technology. And then it was also, well, there was, a can there was candidates identified using that technology, and the actual target was then verified using um, mutational analysis, uh, basically using genome sequencing of resistant mutants, and it was found to be this particular CDK, uh, cyclin-dependent kinase 12. And that, protein, uh, that compound 7, which is shown there, is now being progressed through preclinical candidate development by GSK. So that's an interesting example where, again, they might not have been able to be doable without, without the sort of academics and the knowledge about the biology in partnership with, an, uh, with a pharma company. Um, I think DNDI is involved in that one as well. Um, but this didn't happen by accident because really the pioneer of, of this area in Dundee is Philip Cohen, who is famous across the world, I would say, for having pioneered the field of protein phosphorus and protein kinases, especially in the context of human disease. And so him <coughs> and, Pete, and uh, Pete Downs, who, who uh, set the, this division up, the Division of Signal Transduction Therapy, it's, it's one of the longest uh, running pharma uh, public-private partnerships in the world. It's been running for 20 years and we've had a, a wide variety of, of uh, pharma companies dipping in and dipping out of that pharma uh, partnership. But the current uh, portfolio of three is Boehringer, Glaxo, uh, SmithKline and Merck. Um, and that's um, uh, running until 2020 and uh, hopefully that will continue. Um, it's, it's won awards, it's um, analysis has been done, retrospective analysis has shown that partnership over the last 20 years has been involved in 40 drugs which are now in patients which have got billion dollar sales across the, the world. So, And some of the quotes here you can see uh, both from, uh, from Philip Cohen, you know, his, his uh, determination to try and pull this type of thing off um, has been an inspiration to others within Dundee and in Scotland uh, to try and do things a little bit different and to try and not always just follow uh, or, or just accept a no for an answer if you like. Um, and then the new kids on the block are people like uh, Alessio Chuli, who is working on the hottest thing in, in drug discovery, which is targeted degradation of proteins uh, using Protex technology. And he's based in Dundee. And he was recruited basically because it, it was hot property and it was a very good, exciting area. And he's uh, collecting pharma companies and, and funding uh, for this. And he's spinning out his own company. But he has got a big deal with Boehringer Bo Ingelheim uh, to develop this Protex technology. Uh, he's one of the, probably about three groups in the world that can do this. And so consequently, even though this looks a bit like propaganda, um, Clarivate Analytics has ranked Dundee as one of the most influential scientific institutions in pharmaceutical sciences, which when I saw that, I was actually quite surprised. But then you actually see the actual figures in terms of numbers of papers and the citation per paper. And it's actually incredibly high. And it's above MIT, which aren't necessarily known for their, their uh, pharmaceutical sciences. But nonetheless, it's still a very interesting um, observation, and no doubt another report will come out in a few years' time, which would be a bit different, but who knows, that's the way things go. I'm going to briefly go into the other parts of Scotland, which are doing some great science around this area as well. I'm going to briefly talk about Edinburgh, where there's lots of activity there. We obviously partner with them. How are we doing for time? Ten minutes. Ten minutes, right, flying through. Uh, um, Beats Institute in Glasgow, which I'll, I'll, I'll touch on briefly. Uh, the Costalit Centre in Aberdeen. Uh, which is doing some interesting things in, in drug discovery. And then I'm not going to talk about it specifically, but there's the Scottish Biologics uh, facility in, in Aberdeen, uh, which has uh, really been the, the driving force behind that has been a guy called Andy Porter, um, who's quite an entrepreneurial chap, and, and he's, he's working up this, uh, this facility at the moment. So um, Edinburgh is a huge institution. We've already heard from Ali. Um, all of the exciting things, but they're very, very strong on, on brain sciences and, and dementia as being one of the very key things which the government, UK government, and obviously the world is very interested in trying to tackle. Uh, and so, as, as Ali alluded to, there's the, the Scottish arm, if you like, of the UK Dementia Research Institute is based in Glasgow. But it, it's not just about that. It's about uh, multiple sclerosis, um, uh, ALS, lots of the uh, neuro, ne neurological diseases, um, and psychiatric diseases, which can be hopefully tackled both at the molecular level and the clinical level. And uh, partly that is, comes from collaborations, <coughs> for instance, between <coughs> informatics uh, and regenerative medicine. So the idea that you can uh, recapitulate parts of the brain using brain organoids or using cells which have a disease phenotype, such as in ALS. Um, 
and also then the expertise from the academic and clinical scientists, uh, such as those in, in the IGMM, um, but also in the more fundamental areas of, of research, such as the bio School of Biological Sciences. And so, and my colleague, uh, Neil Carragher, who's a great uh, collaborator as part of the, the PDI and the NPSC, he runs a small lab in Edinburgh, uh, which helps to develop assays, which they then transfer to the NPSC in Dundee. He works, in fact, he, the majority of his money comes from pharma, and he has collaborations with Lilly, GSK, uh, AstraZeneca. Again, again, very much in the cancer phenotyping space. Um, I, I'm not going to have time to go into everything that goes on in Glasgow because it's huge, and so I'm going to pass over to Andrew very shortly uh, to be able to, so he can describe about the exciting things that are going on in Glasgow. Uh, but there's a, also a drug discovery unit in the Beetson Institute, which um, uh, we, we have worked with, and I know quite well the people involved in that, so that's a, a very good unit. Um, and then briefly, uh, the Costless Center in Aberdeen, quite a lot of uh, focus on taking things, uh, really looking at the literature, taking little pieces of research and developing them uh, into preclinical candidates with some very targeted medchem input. And so I'm not going to have time to go into all of these uh, things that are ongoing, and that's just a few of the things that um, Ian Grigg has, has been leading, quite heavily involved with Toronto, actually. Um, but there's some interesting projects there, especially in, in the sort of um, in the pharmacology space. And then the last section, which is a few minutes of um, propaganda, in a way, about the European Lead Factory. And this is a, a pan-European project, and of course, very much in everyone's consciousness at the moment is the importance of the European Union, so I might as well say that I think it is a good thing while I'm on, on, on bro being broadcast, because <laughs> you know, I've always wanted to do that. Uh, <laughs> But the European Lead Factory brings together, it is literally the largest public-private collaborative drug discovery initiative in the world. 30 partners, seven large pharma, really organized under the auspices of the FPA organization, 12 academic institutions and 11 SMEs. And it, total funding is around 200 million euros. And it, it is exactly what it says on the tin, it's the European Lead Factory. So it takes things, it finds hits and then develops them into leads, or the, uh, certainly the produces what's called the qualified hit list, which is the first part of the decision process to work out which needs to go into a hit to lead program. So it's this very early stage of the, of the process of finding a drug. And so the ambition in the future is to push further and further with hopefully more and more money uh, to generate further and further more well-developed molecules as, as you go forward. And the partnerships uh, which are involved in, in this particular project, the University of Dundee, University of Oxford, uh, and essentially a, a, a new company called Biosent, and I'll explain a little bit about that in a minute, and screening centers in various places. Those pharma companies there, uh, which I won't go through the list of, but many people in the, in the audience who have signed up to this um, webinar will be, will be members of those organizations. And then a number of chemistry companies, because the idea of this, um, this initiative is not just to do the same thing as the pharma companies have done already, but to add new chemistry. So what it, how it operates is that we, the chemistry partners pool their resources. So we have pharma partner collections all lumped together into a big collection, and then we have new chemistry coming in, some of which is inspired by natural products, an unusual chemical space. So I think altogether it's about 500,000 compounds, and this is then screened on targets, protein targets, um, in, in various places in, in Holland and also in, in Scotland. And really, Salsa drove the application which this allowed this Scotland to be part of this uh, at a number of different levels. And in fact, the University of Dundee um, and this company called Biosent uh, benefited you know, at least at the tune of 17 million euros over the period uh, of this initial phase. Um, and it's created, it's created jobs. It allowed the old Merck site near Glasgow to be uh, reinvigorated um, and allowed it to really do some quite amazing chemistry and screening activities. Um, and it also allowed this spin-out company, Biosend, to make use of their big uh, compound library and their compound store, the REMP store. I'm not going to go into all the details of the input, uh, the, the outcomes or the deliverables. It's just come to an end. Um, but there have been really positive uh, commercial outcomes, new companies uh, uh, spun out, uh, one on diabetes, one on Parkinson's. Um, we've got drugs to treat multi-drug resistant bacteria coming out and then going into, so that's from Oxford, going into other IMI programs. So that's a really great success, especially in the AMR space, which is very needing, uh, very much needing this type of thing. 
Um, the, and the Sulcer Assay Development Fund was created to really maximize the ability of Scottish researchers to get value out of this project. Because actually the bar for entry into this project is very high. So the farmer standards were applied for quality of the assay. And so actually it was very difficult to get assays developed in an academic setting which would be acceptable. And if you got an assay accepted, you could leverage up to almost like a three quarters of a million pounds worth of activity to get from the screen all the way through to the qualified hit list. And so they, and the value you can attach to that qualified hit list, of course, is potentially unlimited if it's in a, in a very lucrative area. So the idea is, which I think was a, was a stroke of genius, was that the small amount of money, 150,000 pounds, was invested to try and pump prime assay development in Scottish universities. So you had to be within Scotland to be able to apply for that. Um, and then that allowed the assay development to progress to a point which it would be acceptable for the European lead factory. And in fact, what happened is that 11 of the 88 programs in ELF were from Sulsa universities. We've actually leveraged around three and a half million, million euros from this 150,000 um, investment, which I think is a super smart move in terms of what Scotland can do with relatively limited amounts of resource. Um, and it employed postdocs and PhD students who were then trained in drug discovery who will then go off into the wider world and, and, and be beneficial to both pharma maybe and also maybe set their own companies up and so on. Um, and it's, it's been seen to be a, a great uh, example of how knowledge exchange could work uh, interfacing between pharma and, uh, um, and other industries, SMEs as well. So um, this thing is virtually, this is the last slide, thanks. <laughs> You'll be glad. Um, so this has come to an end just now, uh, and the next phase of it, which I can't talk too much about because it's not announced, but the next phase of it, called Esculab, it's still called the European Lead Factory, um, has f slightly fewer partners, slightly less money, quite a lot less money, um, but it's going to be announced soon, and this takes things a little bit further because it, it doesn't just say we're going to do target-based screening, we're going to do phenotypic screening as well, and so we're going to try and make it more patient-centric and hopefully take things over a period of the next 15 years into what's called the European Lead Factory 2030, uh, where we generate preclinical candidates, which then could be partnered with farmers or spun out to commercial enterprises. So that's, where we're, that's, that's my beat. I uh, hope I haven't gone over. Um, Scotland is a really excellent place to do research and to do drug discovery. Um, it, if if it gets further support, this, this type of enterprise, this pooling exercise, then who knows what it can do in the future. And so if there's anyone from the Scottish government listening, then they should, they should take that on board. Um, yeah, that's me done. Thanks for any, anything. Questions? We could go now there's or no later. Questions. There's no questions, that's good. Is there any questions? I, I, I would quite like to ask with the industrial strategy funding that's going right. around, um, my understanding is that if uh, industry has a project and you collaborate with them on it, then basically we should be able to pull money from the Industrial Strategy Fund. Yes. And I'm not aware <coughs> that um, our global colleagues will know that there's this support currently available in Scotland, well, it's not Scotland, it's UK, but yeah. we can get our share of that to the tune of 4.2 billion pounds. Billion, yeah, exactly, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I'm just wondering if there's a mechanism by which um, you already have a kind of template of how you get uh, get into that kind mm -hmm. of line so that if uh, one of the companies here, for example, said to you, well, we'd quite like to do this, say, well, we think that's a great idea, so let's get money from the government to help that, because that's, that is a, that's great. If I put a dollar in and the government puts another dollar in, Absolutely. Um, you know, at, at the end of the day, that's, that's great value. Yeah, so I don't think there's a specific mechanism, and I think it is a little bit nebulous. And part of it is partly because of Brexit, unfortunately. I think there's a little bit of um, lack of understanding about what the routes are. But I think you can go through the research councils, UKRI, go through Innovate UK. There's contacts there which could put people, partner, partner things, uh, get partnerships together. And come to talk to us, come to talk to Salsa. Salsa, right. that's exactly the sort of function Salsa should be doing, I think, personally. Uh, because it stands above the universities. The universities have got their own axe yeah. to grind, their own money to fight for. Yeah. And so, so something like Salsa can actually step above that, or actually, you guys at ABPI, that you can start to sort of broker yeah. things so coming we're together. We're very happy to do that. Um, is, so, because this uh, recording is also, it's live today, but it's also going to be recorded to go out 
yeah. uh, further, so it is going to go to very wide audience. Yeah. And uh, so I think it's it's just to let people know that these opportunities are there because yeah. unless you're actually in the UK, there's very little chance you're going to actually know that they are willing to chip in Absolutely. and match your funding. So there's a huge amount of leverage that can be. Well, that be part great. of the life yeah. science sector deal is just exactly to do that, right? So. Yes. Um, so in fact, the, I didn't really go into the details, but the AI and drug design and development is, that's what we're trying to do. So we're trying to tap into the, the government money, pot some money exactly on that. Uh, and so we're talking to as many pharma companies as we can. Uh, so I probably shouldn't say anything else, but yeah. That's quite, fine, quite no, that's few. fine. But, but fine. As, you know, if, if more people are listening and they want to be part of it, then please do get in touch. Yeah, in it's touch. very exciting. Well, they, it's not funded yet, but it's yeah. in the process of being put together. So. Very good. Yeah. Okay, well, we will be sending out the details mm. for Salsa and yourself and for Andrew um, tomorrow. So I guess it's now, then if there's nothing coming through on the, on the wires just now, um, if we yep. could pass on, on to pass Andrew. Pass on to Andrew. Yeah, sure. <coughs> okay. Thank you, Paul. Well, thank you. Thank you for the invitation to, uh, to present some of, uh, some of our perspective from the University of Glasgow. So. Um, so to start off with, my name is Andrew Tobin. Um, I've been um, in Glasgow for around about two and a half years now, coming on to three years. And so I came, I came up from, from Leicester uh, to really be part of this, uh, of this exciting uh, venture that we have in, in Scotland. And we've really benefited from many of the things that, that, that Paul and Alison have, uh, have talked about up to now. And so, um, and so, and so since you've been given a broad overview of, um, of the opportunities in Scotland and the, um, and the advantages of, of doing drug discovery here, um, I thought that, uh, that I would give you a, a more lab-based perspective of how this works, um, how we're trying to build a center for translational pharmacology um, that's, that's, I guess, rooted in Glasgow, but is, but is designed to, to reach out across Scotland and indeed across the UK and be a, an international center of excellence where we can sort of coalesce um, sort of pharmacology and drug discovery and preclinical uh, discovery. Um, um, so, so just promote that across the UK in general. But we've, been but we've been able to do that, I think, or at least start to do that here in Glasgow because of the network that's generated across Scotland as a whole. So <clears throat> I'm going to try and put that sort of idea, if you like, that center idea in the context of, uh, of the environment that we have in, 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 Glasgow, in uh, Scotland. And so if I just advance my slide here. So, so this gives you an idea. So it's another one of those slides where, where you've got lots of sort of logos and, uh, and all the rest of it. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to give a, a sense. This isn't, of course, uh, the complete picture, but it gives you, it gives you that snapshot of, uh, of what, the, what the scene looks like from my perspective here in Glasgow. So we've got our Center for Translational Pharmacology. We're mostly interested in G-protein coupled receptors. We have an interesting uh, malaria kinase program, which, uh, which I'll touch upon as well. Um, but um, but, uh, but, we, but when, we, when we got here, um, we have a, a, a few things that are already set up. The Glasgow uh, Discovery Center, for example, up here with AstraZeneca, a very strong industry, uh, academic industrial partnership there where, where uh, AstraZeneca have placed postdoctoral workers and technicians within a university laboratory to look at primarily inflammatory disease. I'll give you an example of how we're tapping into, into that and how that actually looks like in terms of our preclinical programs. Of course, we have a list of industrial partners, and it's really helped um, by, uh, by Salsa and by, uh, and, by the, and by things that Paul have talked about from, from Dundee in particular um, to, to, to glue that together. Um, then we've got our uh, Scottish universities that, uh, that I've listed there that are sort of involved in, in, in our centre. And then we have the, uh, the independent organisations, which you've already heard a lot about, the Dementia Research Institute, SOLSA, uh, the European Lead Factory, and all the rest of it. So, so this is now a sort of a, a picture, if you like, of the practical outgoing of, this, of these sort of collaborative networks. And so what we're interested in, and this again is not just my own lab, it's just uh, it's, it's across the piece really, is understanding these three fundamental processes involved in preclinical drug discovery, namely the trigger. What is it that actually activates your drug discovery? What is your drug targeting? How is it targeting it? How is it targeting that protein? How is it targeting that process? What are the structural basis of the drug uh, target interaction? And how do we 
um, maximize the, um, the sort of uh, the cryo EM, uh, uh, X-ray crystallography at atomic level, uh, maximize that understanding to design better drugs that'll be clinically efficacious and less toxic. So that's a start. And then of course, when you hit the trigger, you get a response. What is the cellular response? What is the cellular response you really want in a new drug? And, uh, and that cellular response, of course, we result, we, we, it will, be, will be relevant in terms of a physiological outcome. What is the physiological outcome of activating your trigger, going through a cellular response, giving you a, um, a physiological, clinically relevant response versus a physiologically uh, toxic adverse response? So we want to understand that whole process. Um, and we understand it in the, in the case of GPCRs and, and kinases with, and ion channels and, and other things that come along. So I'm going to give you three sort of little vignettes, if you like, three examples of how we're doing that and how we're, we're able to do that through this extensive network, uh, collaborative network across, uh, across Scotland. And so um, we've already mentioned a dementia. Of course, there's big numbers. You can see them on the slide here uh, of how many people are suffering from dementia. 10 million people in Europe, for example. The cases are going to increase double every, every 20 years. Um, it's predicted by 2040 that dementia will be second to cancer as a cause of morbidity in the first world. Of course, all these numbers come together, but the number that's not on this slide is the number of drugs that are effective against dementia, and that is zero. And so anything we can do in this area, we believe will be impactful. And of course, there's a lot of drug company interest as well as public interest in this area. And so how does this look like in my little scheme of people that we are interacting with across Scotland? And so I'm just going to take away and just leave the, the, the players that are in this particular area here. And so uh, we mentioned the University of Edinburgh, Charles Hardingham, uh, runs the Dementia Research Institute arm in, in, uh, in, in Edinburgh. And I have to say that that organization is very open and very willing to collaborate across Scotland and across the UK and internationally. So we're very grateful for their um, openness and willingness to, uh, to, to allow us to, uh, to access their knowledge and technology and, and, um, and network. And so that's the Dementia Research Institute coming out of the University of Edinburgh. Uh, alongside that is Alzheimer Research UK. <coughs> Again, a very open organization has welcomed us very much into Glasgow, particularly the Scottish uh, framework that's been set up around Alzheimer Research UK. So they're organizing meetings just down the road. Uh, we've just had a meeting uh, of the Scottish arm of the uh, Alzheimer Re Research UK community. And of course, that's all driven out of Salsa, and Salsa has been really a big player in that. Um, we, have, um, we have our industrial partners. Um, Heptaris have a lead molecule in the clinic at the moment, which we are publishing with them um, on the preclinical aspects of that molecule. Very exciting. Probably we're going to be the first, um, the first real symptomatic treatment for memory loss in Alzheimer's disease coming out of that muscarinic program. Eli Lilly, fantastic collaborators again, supporting us in the drug discovery. And of course, when you, when you think about dementia, you think about neurodegenerative disease, you're thinking about a neuroinflammatory disease. And of course, we've been able to link in to the uh, Glasgow Discovery Center uh, there who are interested in, in inflammation generally and neuroinflammation in particular. Okay, so that's all great. So what about a bit of data just to, just to whet your appetite here? So here I have my, my picture of, a, of synapses, of neurons in innovating a region of the brain. Let's say it's a region involved in learning and memory. Let's say it's the hippocampus. Um, and you've got a full, um, full array of presynaptic and postsynaptic neurons uh, with the neurotransmitters being released uh, there to give you a functioning uh, brain. Of course, in neurodegenerative disease, in Alzheimer's disease, you get a loss of those neuronal inputs into the hippocampus, for example, and you get a decrease in neurotransmission in those key learning and memory areas of the brain, resulting in things like mild cognitive impairment, getting that cognitive impairment. And so a number of ways you might want to think of treating a disease of this type, and one of the things is just to replace the stimuli that have been lost replace that with a drug so it activates those receptors which would have otherwise been activated but have now no longer activated because the neurons have been lost and the neurotransmitters have been 
uh, uh, there's less neurotransmission in those brain areas. So the idea is, is that you find a drug and you activate those receptors. Sounds easy, of course, incredibly difficult. What is the target? We've talked already about target validation. And what is the type of drug that you might want to have to do that? Well, we've been working again, as I said, with Lilly and Heptaris and others, and working with the Dementia Research Institute to target this group of proteins called muscarinic receptors. And so these proteins are considered to be really important. These are receptor proteins, important in, re in learning and memory um, in us as well as in, as well as in mice and others. And we find a drug, again, through those screening processes to, uh, to activate uh, these receptors. And we ask whether or not they're going to recover learning and memory. And we're involved in all of that. And I think I've got... Um, and, and so then we need a, a model, a model, an animal model. You heard a little bit from Paul about the importance of models, and it's best if you have a human model. We've got an animal model of disease that we have pioneered in, uh, and moved here in, into, into Glasgow, uh, which we believe is a good, what they call, cholinergic deficit. It's a deficit in, in, the, in neurodegeneration, a neurodegenerative deficit, which most closely mirrors a cholinergic deficit you might see in Alzheimer's disease. And, uh, and this uh, model is prion disease. Uh, that was a cow with BSE. You might remember John Gummer from a few years ago uh, trying to persuade people like us that, uh, that, uh, that it was safe to eat contaminated uh, beef. And uh, here he is feeding uh, his daughter, his four-year-old daughter, Claudia. So if you think that politics is tough today, um, it, it's, it's been like it for some time. And, uh, and here we have Claudia's actually OK today, so just in case you're worried about that. And, um, and so, um, so, so you can get it from scra Scrapey is the, is the sheep version of, uh, of prion disease. And uh, Kaksov Jakob disease is the, is the human form of uh, CJD is the human form of prion disease. OK, so what happens there? So we, so we uh, use this to test whether our drugs can have an effect on learning and memory. And, um, and so what the video here is running, that this is a control mouse. This is a mouse here with prion disease. And this is a mouse here with prion disease, but it's been treated with our drug. And the last time they were in this cage, they, well, in this, in, in this experiment, they've been trained so that when they hear a sound, they're expected to have a mild electric shock. Uh, they're hearing the sound now, and so now they're freezing because they're expecting the shock, but we're not giving them a shock in this experiment, but they're expecting it. This animal has remembered, and so it's frozen. This animal has forgotten, so it's moving around. And this animal has prion disease, but it's freezing the same as the control animal. Um, because it's remembered. So the BQCA, this compound that hits the muscarinic receptors, has recovered learning and memory in this prion deficit model. And there's our BQCA. So it's, this is the molecule that's doing that. So you can see how... Now, that experiment has involved a huge amount of interaction with drug companies, with, the, um, with, uh, with people that, uh, that, that Salsa have put us in touch with, and all the rest of it. So it gives you a practical outcome. You go to publish that stuff, and they say, we don't care about recovery of learning and memory, surprisingly enough, which is a surprise to me. We care about stopping the disease from progressing. So as you know, Alzheimer's disease is a progressive neurodegenerative disease, which results in terminal, uh, it's a terminal disease. And so in our mouse model, we, have got, we are able to, take, to extend this out so the mice become unwell with this disease. And we, we've, had, we've been able to ask the question of whether or not that same molecule, BQCA, that same hitting the same receptors, can slow the progression of neurodegenerative disease. And in the experiment we're going to, I'm showing you here, these mice here have disease, and you can see that they are unwell. And these mice are the same cohort of mice, but on our positive allosteric modulator. We show this data to Eli Lilly. We show this data to Heptaris. We show this data in international meetings. And of course, we have uh, a lot of people that have a lot of interest in that. And we're progressing that as a drug discovery program in partnership with others. I'll give you another example that's coming out of, um, coming out of the center at the moment. Um, which has got huge interest across the, across the certainly the first world, um, in, in the sense that, um, that we've come to know that food does not just give us energy and nutrients. It actually is like almost a hormone. It's almost like a hormone that activates sets of receptors that control our response. So our response, for example, insulin release, gut motility, our sense of well-being, 
are activated by the foods that we eat. And we begin to understand the molecules in the food that's very important. And one of the sets of molecules in the food are these things called essential long-chain free fatty acids. And what a, what a mouthful that is. It's things like your omega-3. It's things like your fish oils. It's these sorts of things that are activating, we now understand, a set of receptors. In the same way those brain receptors I was just talking about, the muscarinic receptors, a set of receptors. And so there's this free fatty acid 1 receptor, free fatty acid 4 receptor. And we've got a number of grants in collaboration again with AstraZeneca and with these, with these companies, because a lot of company interest around this, um, to understand how these, um, how these food products are actually activating the receptors. And can we get drugs that replace the long chain fatty acids so that we can take a drug that will mimic the intake of good foods, if you like, of omega-3 fatty acids? And, uh, and one of the extraordinary things we found is that not only are these free fatty acids in places where you expect it to see it a food response, for example, the gut or the pancreas or something like that, but we're finding these receptors in really unusual places, and one of the places is the lung. And um, so the question is, is what is this receptor doing in the lung? So again, here's my, here's my little picture of the collaborative network, and these are the main players in this. So the European lead factory have been essential in finding these drugs which mimic those omega-3 fatty acids, again through the interaction with Salsa. AstraZeneca, again through an industrial partnership funded through the BBSRC, has provided us with many millions to look at this particular aspect. And of course, it's a gut, it's about inflammation, inflammatory disease again involving uh, AstraZeneca, and also this company Galapagos has been very useful. And so here's the experiment, and this is an extraordinary experiment. And so, so, so we found, so the blue indicates where the receptor is, that free fatty acid receptor 4, supposedly being activated by omega-3. Goodness knows how omega-3 gets there. That's another grant in itself. Um, this is an airway, and these little stripes here are the muscle around that airway. So this, is, um, this, is, so this, this receptor is in the epithelial layer, if you know these things, of the airway um, in, our, in, in our lungs. The question is, what is it doing there? And uh, so we got these drugs, again, out of, the fr out of, out of uh, collaboration with, uh, with, uh, with, with, with Denmark as well as with uh, other places. Um, we've, got, um, we've got a number of drugs, so they're just, they're just drug-like molecules, as you see. And here's a, um, here's a picture of, the, of that airway. So this is now a real airway. And I don't know if you can just see it, but you've got the cilia beating in this airway. I've got a blow-up of it here. You've got the little cilia beating in this airway. So we're able to take this lung, we're able to section the lung, and we're able to keep the lung in tissue culture, that section, so much so that you can get the cilia beating. And the question is now, what does our drug do in this particular scenario? So here we go. Here's, here's, the, here's another airway. We're going to contract the airway as if it's got asthma, and then we're going to have... Um, so there it goes, it's contracting, contracting, and then we're going to add that free fatty acid receptor for agonist, and it relaxes it. And we were, we were just, we, this was an amazing experiment. This is going to go on a loop now. So we, it contracts again there, and then we add the drug and relaxes it. So this is exactly what you want if you have inflammatory airway disease resulting in contraction of the airways, so, such as uh, asthma. And so we're very interested now. I'm applying this practically to the solution of asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And, um, and here you have Westminster in the fog. I think we've all used to that. And so if you want to, if you want to get away from the smog and, the, and the, you know, all, the, all the pollution that you, that you get and all the airway things, you can come to an independent Scotland, of course. This is Glasgow. Um, but the, uh, the other way of doing it is to... Uh, is to have a... Uh, is that too political, I guess it is? <laughs> <laughs> they love it. When I, when, I, when I say that in America, they absolutely love it. <laughs> um, um, when, okay, so this is an ozone model. So there's lots of models, and we've got asthma models, we've got pollution models, we've got an ozone model here. And, um, and here you've got the airways contracting, increasing resistance in the lung, and with our, with our free fatty acid receptor ligand, you get a relaxation. So you can see how now AstraZeneca and other companies are extremely interested in that. 
Okay, with last, my last example, and, um, and my last example is, uh, and it links very much with Paul's interest and links very much with the uh, Dundee Drug Discovery Unit, is our, is our work with, uh, with malaria. And again, we're very excited to be in Glasgow with the Wellcome Trust um, Centre for Integrative Parasitology, which is, uh, which is a big part of that. So, of course, malaria is a big numbers game. Of course, you've all, you all know about it. Uh, lots of people around the world are suffering from malaria, lots of people with malaria. It kills um, a, a good many people as well, and, and often very vulnerable people, uh, such as the young and the old. And, uh, and the world is becoming resistant to the current chemotherapeutic agents, chloroquine being one, artemisinin being another. So, so the world does need new, uh, new inhibitors, and it was really exciting to hear the work that's coming out of Dundee with their inhibitor at the moment. Um, and so needless to say, here's my panel again, and uh, needless to say, Dundee are a big players in this. GlaxoSmithKline uh, are terrific through the Tres Cantos uh, Open Lab Foundation. Uh, the lead factory, I'm already talking to people like Paul about looking at how we're progressing this through the lead factory. And of course, the Dundee Drug Discovery Unit have been key, uh, Mike Ferguson in particular, in, in supporting this program. And so very briefly, you've already touched upon it, it's, uh, it's the red blood cell cycle that is the key one if the parasite, the, for the parasite to give you the symptoms of disease, and then the parasite uh, leaves this red blood cell cycle and goes into a sexual stages where it makes gametocytes, uh, and, uh, and these gametocytes, male and female, are the things that infect the insect. So if you want to treat somebody, you treat the symptomatic phase, you treat the blood phases, phases. If you want to stop transmission, which is what Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation want to do, you hit the gametocyte stage because it doesn't go into the insect. And so the bar is high. I think I've just, I'll just show you this, uh, this little movie, this little illustration of a single cell. Is that, that's what a malaria parasite is, is a single cell organism. Finds a red blood cell, an oxygen carrying cell in the body, tumbles around and, uh, and, uh, and binds to the surface of the red blood cell. It then reorientates and enters the red blood cell and it forms what you call a ring stage. And I think I've got a picture of the ring at the top there, sort of working this video. Uh, once inside there, the red blood cell, it then, it then grows and, oh, there's the ring stage there. Uh, once inside the red blood cell, it sort of grows in the red blood cell. It's uh, consuming the, um, or breaking down at least, the hemoglobin to form this trophozoite stage. The trophozoite stage then moves on to sort of making little baby parasites, if you like, the syncytial of, syncytium of nuclei form the individual parasites, which is a schizont stage, and then it just breaks open and it's able to infect other red blood cells. And I think I've got a, a um, and that's that cycle, takes 48 hours to go through, goes round and round, and that's what makes people ill. So I think this is a video that I have of this process actually happening. Um, and um, I think I might have to click it once, actually. Yes, I think it did. And, um, and so here you've got a parasite just sitting on the outside there, and it will just, uh, just enter this red blood cell, get a, a sort of a push from its friend. They don't really communicate with each other, but they push from its friend, and it invades that red blood cell. So that's the invasion of a red blood cell by a malaria parasite. If you could stop that, you would cure malaria. So we've got a drug that we found from screening a library at GlaxoSmithKline in, in Tres Cantos in Spain. And, um, and this is that 48-hour cycle without the drug. And you can see the shies at the end here. And this is the 48-hour cycle, cycle in the presence of the drug. You don't need to be a parasitologist to see this is working. Um, this is the drug itself, just as Paul presented a really nice nature paper. We'd, we've got a similar author list on a science paper, which, uh, which I'm hoping to get out at some point, uh, if I can get back to the lab to do it. Um, and um, and, it's, um, and that's, that's, what, that's what we're doing there. So as Paul said, that kills this stage. So thumbs up for that, kills it rapidly. All those medicines for malaria venture um, criteria need to be fulfilled. Um, it, does it kill the insect stage? And this is an extraordinary thing about being in this collaborative environment is that we're able to do this experiment which my lab would never have been able to do before. Why? Because there are people that can actually do this membrane feeding experiment. This is an extraordinary experiment where you take human red blood cells, you infect them with the malarial parasite. So now they've got all the, the, their, their red blood cells infected with the malaria parasite. You induce that red blood cells to have more of those gametocytes, more of those things that infect the insect. The insect, then you get a mosquito and you, and, you, and you allow the mosquito to feed on that blood, and the mosquito will take up those, those, those gametocytes, and then the gametocytes will grow in the gut of the mosquito. 
And you know that because you dissect the gut and you count the mosquito, you count the infected, uh, you count the oocysts, you count the, uh, the parasites in the gut of the mosquito. What an extraordinary experiment that is. Even if I describe it, it sounds great. And so I've got a picture of it actually happening here. So this is, um, these, are the, these are the mosquitoes, of course. This is that blood just there. And the mosquitoes, you can see now, feeding. We've got them at different cups. They're feeding on the back. So these are female mosquitoes. They're feeding because they want to feed their eggs. And uh, they've been starved overnight. And they're gorging themselves on this blood. They eat so much of the blood. They take so much of the blood in. It sort of passes right through their body. And it sort of drips on the bottom of the cup. And you can just see some of the drips there, which means that the feeding is going on. And four days later, we look at the gut of this mosquito, possible because we've come to Scotland. And you can see the closed peg is a very important part of the experiment. <laughs> so, so, so it's, and, and you'll be pleased to hear, I'm sure, I'm sure the Dundee lot will be pleased to hear, that this actually kill, stops that transmission. So we can stop the red blood cell cycle and we can stop transmission. And now in partnership with GlaxoSmithKline, Medicines for Malaria Venture, driven by partnership with the Dundee Drug Discovery Unit, we can now actually pursue this as a real hardcore drug discovery program, which we hope. And it hits a kinase, by the way, which is a, which is a sort of now seats for the technical people. OK, so I think this is, is it. So I think I've just, given, I've just painted a picture now of how this network, in just the two and a half years that I've been here, um, it, it, I've been able to access this as an academic scientist to do preclinical drug discovery, which we can actually take forward with some confidence to the ambition of having full-scale drug discovery. Why? Because of people like Salsa, because of the people um, that we've heard about in terms of drug discovery units in here, um, National Phenotypic Center and the like, gives us the infrastructure to actually deliver on that ambition. And so I'm happy to take questions, and, um, and that's my presentation to you. Thank you very much. Now, uh, can we ask people online if they would like to join, as it says there, Sligo? Um, I think you've got a button there. Yeah. And um, if you'd like to ask uh, some questions. So here's one uh, from Greg and Ross. Um, and I think this is a great question, actually, is what defines how you first find your pharma partners. Is it historic, is it luck, or planned approach, or hopefully in the future, global showcasing meetings? <laughs> so I wonder if you want to, to answer that, if, uh, how you, because you've obviously got a range of, of companies that you are already working with, so was it just fortuitous, or was it a, a managed way that you went around uh, to, to get them on board? Uh, I can speak from the point of view of the National Phenotypic Screening Centre's Phenomics Discovery Initiative, uh, I think it was partly historical um, because of connections actually with Salsa with MSD, so we were trying to get MSD on board, and, and some people that were, knew each other at the Johnson Johnson Innovation Centre, for instance. Uh, but then, subsequent to that, um, MSD didn't join the consortium, but then we went around all of the other pharma companies just basically knocking on doors and right. getting them to join. So I think you've obviously got to have contacts. You definitely do go to meetings, uh, pharmaceutically oriented meetings, drug discovery meetings, and you go and press the flesh and just make the connections and, and then go from there. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It would be nice to think there was some kind of ABPI joined up thing where they could potentially, you could come and say, we've got this potentially exciting framework and would you be able to contact your partners or it could be FP or it could be whoever but, um, but you have a, you'll have a different well I, I, I think I think that the, the, the landscape is changing so <coughs> so the um, so drug drug companies by and large and um, if, if drug companies are online then please contradict me if I'm wrong or, 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 or at least add to this are pulling out a preclinical drug discovery so they need to have um, good um, good a good good lines into the universities and often they look at it because they look at the literature of course and I think that we, you highlighted a, a company coming forward from a paper um, so they're looking at the literature and they're trying to find the, the, the right partners and so we need a conduit in both directions both the academics uh, and the and the companies and I think the sort of things that you talked about Paul the sort of things that Alison talked about um, are really great places to go to find out who the best partner is. 
I mean, I was, I was taken with Paul's uh, um, thing there, and I've got a number of questions I have for Paul at the end of it, how to drive our drug discovery programs, because you have the contacts. And so, and Alison has the contacts, and so these are great people to come to. So I would say to you, don't be shy of going to the drug, uh, Dundee Drug Discovery Unit, talking to Mike Ferguson, talking to people like myself, like Paul, Alison, and, um, and getting those links that's going to be the key link, because these companies are big, and it's difficult, I agree with you, to find the right person in the company. But of course, you've got to get the shoe leather on, and you've got to be prepared to go to the companies, uh, present in front of three people, you know, and all those sorts of things that you need to do to, um, to, to take the gamble. Um, but, uh, but I think there's more available now in the, 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 you know, the European Lead Factory is a great place to go to. Mm -hmm. and, um, and they may not fund your project straight away, but you're getting your hands dirty and you're finding out the right, the right links. Do you think that's a fair yeah, comment? Right, yeah. Yeah. Do you ever put out business cases to pharmaceutical companies and say, we can do this trial for you that we think would be of interest and this is how long it's going to take and this is how much it's going to cost and this is what you can expect um, you know, to be the kind of linear planning uh, involved in this. I mean, I, I don't um, because I, I don't think like that. It's, it's, a, it's a great idea though. I can't see why. I think that they, they might respond better to that than, than, um, than the... So the, so the link we have with Eli Lilly, for example, started out from a research meeting uh, being known in the muscarinic field and for inviting the Eli Lilly people to come to the meeting. They came to the meeting, relationship was formed, we would then go to Lilly, we had a student through Lilly, but then the guy who is our main contact in Lilly was, um, was, was, you know, decided he would move on. Um, and, so we, and so what did we do? Well, the first thing we did was get on a plane to Indianapolis and, and give a talk and try and build a relationship with a new cohort of people. And, um, and, so, and that has worked very well. So it's, it's a bit of both, really. I mean, if we pulled a business case together, it might have well, worked. Well, you've all got business schools, and in fact, well-accredited business schools um, in, attached to you know, Dundee, mm -hmm. Strathclyde, uh, Glasgow. Um, and so I was just wondering if um, bringing their expertise together with your own uh, could help basically drive the, the business case as to why uh, companies should think about coming to Scotland. But you, but you put forward a business case. So we went to, to it was interesting to see Janssen on there. We went to Janssen and, um, and they invited us to, on the free fatty acid program actually to, um, to look at that. And, my, and, um, and I presented them a, a case and, and, and they basically said, yes, but what can you do in six months? And I said, well, virtually nothing. Um, and so, and so, but I said, if you give us a hundred thousand pounds, we can leverage one million pounds. Mm. And they said, well, they, yeah, but that was a nice body language. They didn't have that body language. So we left <laughs> and we said exactly the same thing to AstraZeneca. They had the right body language. They gave us a hundred thousand pounds. We now have a 1.2 million pound program with them. So it sometimes works really well and it sometimes doesn't work very well. Okay. I think, um, we're yeah. close unless there's anything else that's come through. Okay. Well, that was great. I would like to thank the people that are online because nobody left us despite the unwanted <laughs> sound effects. So thank you all very much for that. I think we now have it sorted. And thank you very much uh, to Paul in particular yeah, for yeah, managing to carry on, which shows <laughs> the kind of stoic spirit that we have up here. <laughs> and, uh, and thank you very much for joining us today. And if you do have any questions, any further questions you want to ask directly, as we say, we'll be putting out all the details uh, to you tomorrow. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you very much.